All right. Okay. I guess we'll be starting right now. Uh, welcome to the uh, Xinyuan workshop with Professor Duffy as the main speaker. So I will give a very short introduction of Professor Duffy. He is the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management and a Professor of Finance at Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's visiting New York Fed this year. And uh, I, I look at his bio and there are so many things. Um, I'll just tell you that he's at the very top of our um, academia you know, ladder. He was the 2009 president of American Finance Association. And his research interests include over the counter markets, banking, financial stability, credit risk, valuation, and hedging of derivative securities term structure, and many, many other financial topics. He has many papers, many books. Uh, at the end, I would like to mention that Professor Duffy has been to China several times. And the most recent one, I hope, was that he came to PBCSF and gave a seminar in the summer of 2018 with the topic being post-crisis bank regulations and the financial market liquidity. Of course, today he is coming in and to talk about a brand new topic on um, AXI. Um, so if you want to know what's AXI, it's called Across the Curve Credit Spread Indices. So now, Professor Duffy, you have one hour to talk. And if anybody have any questions, and Professor Duffy mentioned that if you want to stop him and ask the questions, Please do. All right, I'm done. <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much, Xiaoyan. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I want to uh, talk about credit sensitive reference rates today and their role in, uh, in the banking system. And uh, the main stimulus for this uh, get together with everybody here is that there is a new credit sensitive reference rate that's been developed <clears throat> based on some academic research that I did with Professor Antia Berndt and Professor Yi Chao Ju, uh, both of them at Australian National University. And that uh, reference rate is called AXI, A-X-I, or Across the Curve Index. Uh, since we developed this uh, index of credit sensitive reference rates, the idea for AXI has been implemented in practice by Sofer Academy. And uh, Marcus Burnett is here today, and he's the founder and uh, uh, the head person at uh, Sofer Academy. And uh, Marcus has done amazing work on reference rates in general, and he has actually implemented AXI, and it's now available commercially through Invesco. Marcus, I'm sure, can comment on that later today. But this is not a commercial presentation. I'm not advertising on behalf of Marcus. Uh, but I'm very grateful that uh, his firm has picked up this idea and implemented it in practice so that now banks around the world, uh, country by country, can implement this uh, way of uh, indexing their loans and other, con other credit contracts to a credit sensitive reference rate. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important. <clears throat> I'm also gonna show some slides. Let me uh, find my slides and uh, I'll, I'll get started by showing those. Hang on a second while I do that. They're here somewhere. I've been looking at various things this morning. Here we go. So, and I, I, as Xiaoyan has mentioned, I'm very interested in getting questions. So. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions. This will take a moment to go to full screen and then we'll we'll start talking about AXI. <clears throat> Let me repeat again, Xiaoyan, how pleased I am that you invited me to this presentation. As you mentioned, I've been to the PBO, uh, PBC school uh, a number of times and it's always a pleasure. I usually go in person, uh, but that doesn't turn out to be possible today. We still see you in person. Um, yeah, well, invite me back. Yeah, I will. okay, that's a promise, right? 
Good. Uh, the more the more often, the better. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> before I get started, I want to, in addition to Marcus uh, and his firm, I want to acknowledge collaboration with others. As you can see from uh, just below the title, <clears throat> I'm going to be drawing today on work with Antje Berndt, Harry Cooperman, Stefan Luck, Zachary Wang, Ilen Yang, and Yi Chao Ju. I already mentioned Antia uh, and Yi Chao. They are my collaborators on de the development of Axie several years ago. And in new work uh, at the New York Fed, where I'm visiting this, uh, this term, I'm, I'm developing with Cooperman, Luck, Wang, and Yang uh, new research showing how important it is that banks have access to credit-sensitive reference rates. And the reason for that will become clear, but most importantly, <clears throat> for linking commercial corporate loans to this reference rate, it turns out to be much more efficient uh, for providing credit. It's a lower cost form of credit to corporate consumers. Today, I'm also gonna be referencing a new paper <clears throat> on AXI, the cross the curve spread index that is the main subject today. Uh, uh, this new ver this new work is implementing Axie in China, and Xiaoyan, who's here today, is one of the collaborators. The other collaborators are Li Zhiyong, Zhang Zhijian, Zhang Fudong, lots of Zhangs, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> because I'm drawing a little bit in my work with uh, the New York Fed on data from the New York Fed that are not publicly available and research coming out of the New York Fed, I need to say that uh, none of the views that I'm expressing today are necessarily the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. <clears throat> okay, so with all of that, let me get started. Let me explain what we're looking for here in terms of a credit spread index for making bank loans. The first thing uh, that we need, there are three things that we would like an index to have. The first one is kind of obvious. If it's a credit spread index, then it has to move with credit spreads. And that's important because as you'll see, if it's not already obvious, uh, when bank funding costs go up because their credit quality demands higher compensation in the market, uh, then they want to get compensation from their borrowers through higher borrowing rates so that they have an offset. And this uh, promotes hedging. And it also, as I'll describe later, improves credit provisions for credit lines. Credit lines uh, are contracts to provide credit where the borrower decides how much credit to take after the line is contracted. And that's uh, the perfect application for a credit sensitive index. And in case you're wondering, is this some sort of exotic financial product? Is a credit line something a little bit unusual? No, it's actually the majority of corporate loans are in the form of credit lines in the United States. And I'm hoping someone in China that's here today will tell me whether credit lines are also a very big deal in China. But remember, most corporate credit in the United States is provided on credit lines. The second thing that we want is robustness, meaning the there's no doubt about where the credit spread index should be based on lots of data. And so you need a large pool of data. And uh, as, as you know, or most of you know, LIBOR, the main credit sensitive index for the US dollar is going to be discontinued next June. And the reason it's gonna be discontinued is that there's not enough data. Uh, when the LIBOR number is published, it's based on almost no data some days and on average, very little data because there are so few uh, bank borrowings that happen at the LIBOR maturity, which is typically about three months. And so we're, as the uh, regulators get rid of LIBOR, there are very few alternatives. I'll discuss some of the alternatives later, but AXI is an alternative and it does not rely on a small amount of data. As you'll see from the China context, from Xiaoyan's paper, there are lots of data to make LIBOR 
a mit to part of me to make axi. And then the last property that we would want is that the index that you're using will adapt to changes in how banks issue their own debt. So the reason we have problems with LIBOR is that banks are not issuing three month debt anymore or hardly any in the United States. They're, they're now issuing longer term debt. Maybe in the future, they'll go back to shorter term debt. Maybe at some point they'll go to medium term debt or an average across all of those. What you want is an index that adapts as banks change their issuance patterns. And Axi does that because Axi simply samples across all issuances of banks out to five years of maturity. And so it automatically adapts as banks change their issuance to from short to long or long to short or somewhere in between. So what, it, what does Axie look like? Well, uh, from the paper by Xiaoyan and her colleagues, you can see uh, what Axie looks like. It's the, I'm colorblind, but I think it's green. Is it green, Xiaoyan? Well, there, there, there are three lines. Uh, yeah, but Axie is the middle one, right? What the color is green? Yes, yes, short term is red and long term is blue. Middle one is green? It is green. It is green, yes. Yeah, okay, good. So the middle one is Axie for China. And as you can see, Axie is the average between a longer term uh, index called long-term Axie and a shorter term index called short-term Axie. The number Axie simply is the average of the two. And you can see that actually during this period, 2017 to 2022, they all pretty much moved together. Although the, as, no, as normal, the longer term uh, credit spreads are higher than shorter term credit spreads. That's pretty typical. It's not always true, but it's pretty typical. And you can see most recently that they've been staying pretty close together. Okay, so that, this gives you a rough idea of what Axie is. It's just the average of long-term credit spreads and short-term credit spreads. In a minute, I'll describe how those long-term and short-term credit spreads are calculated. But it's a pretty simple idea now, as, as everybody here can see, Axie is just the average credit spread for bank borrowing. And because of that, it reflects the average borrowing costs of banks, exactly what you would want for a credit sensitive index. And remember, this is not the total borrowing rate, it's the credit spread above the risk-free rate. And if you want the total borrowing rate, you can simply add the risk-free rate. This is not, uh, um, uh, should not be interpreted as how much you would have to pay on a given borrowing. It's an average across all borrowings. It doesn't go with any particular maturity. It's an average across all maturities. Okay, so here's the algebra, which is pretty simple. What is the index? Uh, well, it's the sum across all maturities M of the quantity of debt that's been issued in the last year at a particular maturity, that's QM, multiplied by the credit spread, the average credit spread of all issues in that maturity bucket. So M could be zero to one year, one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five. There are five buckets. Actually within the one year bucket, there are some sub buckets, which I'll show you in a minute. And so Axie is just the weighted average of credit spreads across different maturities where the weights for a given maturity bucket is the fraction of total issuance in the last year that goes into that bucket. So for example, if banks have issued 20% of their debt in the last year in the two to three year maturity bucket, then Q for that bucket is 20%. And you multiply by the credit spread for the two to three year maturity bucket and you do the same for every other maturity bucket, add them up, the weighted average is Axie. Could not be simpler. That's the idea anyway, it's supposed to be very simple. It's just weighted average credit spread. Now I'm gonna pause for the moment just to see if there are any clarifying questions. Does anybody not understand the construction of Axie, at least at this very high level? In a minute, I'll tell you where we get the credit spread data SM, but for the moment, I'm happy to take any questions. Xiaoyan, do you see any hands raised? Because I cannot see from my screen. No, no, no. We are all learning. 
Okay, good. Okay, so now let's go to China. As I mentioned, Xiaoyan, this actually was first implemented for US banking system, but Xiaoyan and her colleagues have implemented it for China. And since uh, most, of, most of you today are in China, I thought I would show her results. So this is Xiaoyan's uh, results for the transactions volume in each of the longer term buckets, one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to five shown in these, in these colors. Now I'm colorblind, but I think you can probably tell from the legend which is which. And you can see that since 2019 or, or so, there's plenty, plenty of data with which to estimate Axie because there are billions and billions of dollars of issuances. So this is not like LIBOR or maybe SHIBOR. I'm not familiar with how much data there are for SHIBOR, but for Axie, there are tons of data since 2019. You can also see some something problematic around the beginning of 2018, where there are very few data. And uh, if that were the case today, that would be a problem for releasing Axie. You would have to do some sort of emergency fix, like take a weighted average over more than a recent period to get a longer term average. <clears throat> and that would not be very satisfactory on a long term basis. You wouldn't want to have so little volume under underlying your, your index for a long period of time. But for a short-term emergency, it's OK. Uh, Xiaoyan, uh, I don't mean to put you uh, on, the, on the spot, but do you think there could be a, a future period in which we would end up with this kind of a problem where we have almost no data? I don't see that's very likely because the Chinese uh, interbank bond market has been growing bigger and bigger and transaction and liquidity, they're pretty good. So I wouldn't think that would be a problem. I, I, I won't be able to, I, I don't know perfectly, but I don't think that would be a problem. It would be more data, not less. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that uh, <laughs> because if you look after 2019, and as you say, the interbank market has been growing rapidly. Uh, things are looking very robust. So if you remember, one of the three criteria is robustness. You need a lot of data, and there are plenty of data at, at these longer maturities. Here are the spreads of each of the maturity buckets from Xiaoyan's paper. So one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to five. And remember, Axi, for a long-term Axi, you just take the weighted average within each of these maturity buckets, weighting by uh, the uh, outstanding amounts of issuance over the past year of the spreads uh, shown for each of these buckets. And these spreads are based on the average of the uh, secondary market or interbank market traded spreads, uh, in this case from the China interbank bond market, CIBM. In the United States, we get our data from TRACE, which is the transactions data record for all US corporate bonds. So these are not loans, these are bonds. So pretty simple idea. And as you can see, the spreads at each maturity are moving in very close correlation. So that makes the index even more robust because there's, to the extent that any one of these is noisy, the noise tends to average out. Here are the spreads in the short-term maturity bucket. Here we have four buckets, zero to one month, one to three, three to six, and six to nine. Again, they move in high correlation. And uh, the short-term axi is the weighted average of these spreads, again, with weights by issuance. It's a little bit more complicated for short-term uh, than for long-term. I'm not gonna go into the details, but you can read about them either in Xiaoyan's paper or in the paper on my website uh, that describes the original implementation of Axie in 2019 for US banking. <clears throat> so again, pretty simple. Take the weighted average of these spreads to get the short-term Axie, and then average short-term Axie and long-term Axie together to get Axie. And you saw already what it looks like for China. Here's what AXI has looked like in the United States up till the paper that I wrote with my colleagues, Antia Berent and Chao Ju. And I've also plotted AXI uh, with another time series 
which is the Financial Conditions Credit Spread Index, or FIXI, F-X-I. And what is FIXI? Well, it's the same as AXI exactly, except rather than limiting to bank issuances, we go to the entire corporate issuance market, all issuances of all public firms. And then we do the same averaging. Then we come up with the FIXI index. And as you can see, since about 2013, AXI and FIXI are just about the same. So if you wanted to, you could substitute, if you didn't have enough data, Xiaoyan, for example, some year in the future, you didn't have enough data in the bank bond market, you could go to the entire corporate bond market, investment grade in this case, and mm -hmm. you would do about, about the same. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty close match, as you can see. Now, there are some years like December 2011, the match is not that good. There was a banking crisis around that time. And uh, so the Axie index was higher than the Fixie index. Uh, but normally they're very close together. The correlation is extremely high. And the, now, why would you want to use Fixie? Well, first, for two reasons you might use Fixie. One is you get five times as much data, five times as much transaction. So it's even more robust. The other reason you might want to use it is that there could be a general application for a corporate credit spread index. Like maybe somebody wants to write a new type of credit derivative that settles on corporate credit spreads. There already are CDS indices, but those are all restricted to five years and they're only derivative transactions. Here with Fixie, you get the average of all credit spreads of all corporate issuers. And you could say that Fixie is basically a measure of corporate, uh, the cost of corporate credit above the risk-free rate. So it's a wonderful index. And I imagine that if Marcus, uh, uh, if Marcus's uh, success is uh, going to continue, then people all over the world will start to write contracts based on Fixie. Marcus's firm also provides Fixie and, and th those data are publicly available. So anyone could write a derivative contract that either hedges or speculates on corporate credit by writing a contract on Fixie. That could be a swap contract, for example. So that would be a really natural financial product in a country like China or the United States. Can I, can I, um, I need to mention one thing, uh, Daryl, um, yeah. which is that um, there is a noticeable segmentation in China between the interbank market and exchange market. So, yeah, I think we we can come up with the uh, yeah when there is no not enough data to do axi for China, we definitely can use the you know the corporate bonds market. But then yeah, just like your axi and 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 uh, then the foxy. Did you call it foxy? Fixy FXI. Fixy. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering like. In the United States, the separation is that bigger? I mean, but then in the end, they're about the same, right? The, the segmentation is that serious? In all but crisis periods, they're about the same. Okay. All right. So we, we definitely should try that. Thank you. Yep. And in China, uh, the corporate bonds, there are a lot of corporate bonds traded in the interbank market. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And, uh, you know, the exchange market, as you know, in China is smaller than the interbank market. Right. But even though even though it's called interbank, uh, it's it doesn't mean that they're only bank bonds. There are already there are many corporate issues that are trading in the interbank market. It's by far the largest corporate bond market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely can try this. Thank you. Okay, so I want to move to U.S. data in some recent work uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. These are Fed Federal Reserve uh, data. So remember my qualification. Not, nothing I'd say is necessarily the views of the Fed. Uh, and you can see by uh, loan type, we have credit lines on the left-hand column, term loans, other commercial and industrial loans, and then commercial real estate. Those are the loan types. And then the amount of loans outstanding at the end of 2019 for the 20 largest US banks, only the 20 largest US banks. So uh, China has five of the 10 largest banks in the world. 
Uh, they're larger than US banks. China has the world's largest banking system, larger even than the US. Um, that's, that's good news and bad news. It means that uh, Chinese firms are heavily in debt. <laughs> uh, uh, but also, uh, the China has a huge economy approaching the size of the United States. So it's not surprising. It has a very large banking market. And uh, bank lending is a bigger application in China than in the US. In the US, firms issue bonds more than loans. And China firms issue loans more than bonds. Uh, here's the US data, and you can see uh, there's a lot of loans. There's 1.6 trillion outstanding of borrowing. That's the number right here, 1.579 trillion at the end of 2019 of loans from the 20 largest banks. Now that's outstanding credit. The committed credit to the same borrowers is 3.6 trillion. That's the next column over. COMM stands for committed. That means the banks have already signed contracts telling, let's say, Marcus, uh, Marcus, you can borrow up to $800 million in the next four years. And right now you've only borrowed $300 million. So committed means that's 800 million is committed to Marcus. He doesn't need to draw all of it. He can draw however much he wants. The percent utilized in the US banking system was 44%. That means 56% of committed lines were not drawn at the end of 2019. Now that's, uh, that's a lot of outstanding credit. If you look at the difference between committed and utilized, that's on the order of uh, $2 trillion of commitments. Banks have said, you can borrow up to $2 trillion more and it's all on pre-agreed loan terms. Those loan terms at the end of 2019 were almost all based on LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate, which is a credit sensitive rate, meaning borrowers had to pay uh, the LIBOR index plus a borrower fixed spread. Okay, now comes the drama, the exciting part. This is the end of 2019. And I'm sure everybody remembers what happened in the spring of 2020. There was a major disaster, a macroeconomic disaster called COVID. A major pandemic was declared on March 12th. And when that happened, the corporate bond market went kind or the corporate loan market went kind of crazy because corporations all over the world, including the United States said, oh, you mean I can borrow another $2 trillion? Wow, this is just the right time to do that. Uh, and they borrowed like crazy. So I'm going to show you in a minute some charts, but let's just look at uh, some of the basic ideas in this new work I'm doing with Cooperman, Luck, Wong, and Yang. Uh, so the, the idea here is that when you've got a stress period like the COVID pandemic or the great financial crisis, borrowers, corporate borrowers say, oh, I'm going to draw on some of my committed credit. And that increased uh, commercial and industrial lending during the great financial crisis, global financial crisis by about 7%, which is huge. And in the COVID shock of 2020, it increased corporate borrowing by about 20%, which is huge, about $300 billion. So borrowers went to the banks and said, we want $300 billion, please, on pre-committed lines. And the bank said, oh, gosh, this is not good because now we have to go find $300 billion to lend to you. And if borrowers have to, the, if the banks have to go into the market to find $300 billion of funding, they have to borrow at their own credit spreads. And guess what? In March of 2020, the bank credit spreads went way up. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Well, so that's bad news. That means that uh, banks may have to get a lot of new funding just when it's very expensive for them. And I'm going to show you in a minute why that means that uh, having a credit sensitive reference rate is very valuable to banks. So what is the cost to bank shareholders of providing credit in this way? It's the amount of funding that's required uh, by line draws multiplied by the bank's credit spread on that additional funding. That's 
a loss to bank shareholders. And so bank shareholders want to get compensated for incurring that loss. Uh, if they have risk-free reference rates for their loans, they're not going to get compensated because the borrowers are going to say, hooray, I get to borrow. When credit spreads are way high, I get to borrow at a really low risk-free rate plus a pre-contracted spread. Uh, so that's not good for the banks. And uh, when that happens, it's bad news. So banks are know in advance that's, that could happen and they price that into their terms. Banks are gonna charge a lot more, depending on all the details, are gonna charge a lot more if they contract their credit lines to a risk-free rate rather than a risky rate. It's gonna cost borrowers more to borrow and the total amount of borrowing will be less. If you don't have a credit sensitive rate, borrowing will be less. If you do have a credit sensitive rate, then banks are gonna say, oh, good, I won't have this problem if something crisis comes up. So you can, uh, uh, I can give Marcus a, a big credit line and not worry too much that he's gonna draw heavily on me because if he does, he's gonna compensate me. Whoops, went too far, there we go. So let's see in the picture what happened in March of 2020. There's two time series or two sets of time series. On the left-hand axis is plotted credit spreads in basis points. And on the right-hand axis is the amount of credit that was drawn. And so the first line I'm gonna review for you is this line. Maybe somebody could tell me the color of this line. It's a light green. Light green, okay. Well, that light green line, is the total amount of corporate and industrial loans that were drawn. And you can see that went from about 1300 billion to about 1600 billion over the course of a few weeks only. That was a massive draw on credit lines. And banks were, you know, banks ha bankers had their hair on fire. It's an expression in English. It means, wow, we're in big trouble now. We have to find $300 billion somewhere. If we have to go out and borrow it, it's a big problem because this is the LIBOR. Uh, what's the color of this LIBOR number here? A little uh, bit darker green. A different green. Okay, so this is not good for colorblind people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Bank said, oh no, we have to find $300 billion and our cost of borrowing has gone way up. Here's where it was before. Here's where it went to. It went up about 100 basis, over 100 basis points. And banks said, oh no, by the way, there's two different credit sensitive reference right here. One is LIBOR and one is uh, LIBOR OIS, that's the credit spread. And the other is Bisbee OIS, that's a, a substitute for LIBOR, which has also been criticized for not having very good robustness. Now, I'm, uh, I have another slide I'll show you later for what Axie does. Axie also zooms up during this period. Uh, to, I think it's around 200 basis points. We'll see in a minute. Anyway, you, if these credit sensitive reference rates are great because if the loans are linked to these credit sensitive reference rates, then the banks are gonna say, oh, Marcus, you're gonna draw 300 billion? It's a good thing you're paying me LIBOR plus a credit spread because that means I get this money coming in and that will compensate me for my additional borrowing costs. On the other hand, if our loans were linked to SOFR, which is this color down here. What's what's the SOFR color, Xiaoyan? It's a bluish green. Oh my God, I'm so descriptive. <laughs> it's a bluish, bluish green. Yeah. Okay, my collaborators love green, I guess. Uh, this this would put me in real in a real fix if my loans were linked to SOFR because Marcus, who has the credit line, is gonna say, what, I can borrow at this low number way down here? Yeah, I wanna borrow a whole lot. And I'm gonna say, oh no, that means you're going to borrow even more than $300 billion because now you can borrow at a really low rate rather than the $300 billion, which was borrowed at this very high rate. So Marcus is going to go crazy. He's going to borrow like crazy. And now I have to go find even more funding. And that's very expensive. Now, knowing that this might happen two years ago when we made this deal, I told Marcus, look, if you want a SOFR reference rate on your loan, you're gonna kill me when we get to a crisis. So I'm gonna charge you a big high cost for accessing that line. But on the other hand, if you take a LIBOR or an AXI line, 
then I'm not going to charge you so much because I'm not so worried that you're going to draw like crazy when we get into a crisis. And if I tell Marcus, you can pick this one, the SOFR one, or you can pick the LIBOR one or an AXI one, then Marcus is going to say, well, you better give me the AXI one because otherwise the cost of getting the line will be too good, it will be too big or you won't give me enough of a line. And that's what this paper that I wrote with Cooperman, Luck, Wang, and Yang proves mathematically in a model and then demonstrates empirically. That's what we do in this paper. Mm, that's not good. This, this disappeared. Maybe it's stuck. Let me break out of this for a second. Somehow I got out of that. Okay, let's try another one. Here's what Axie did uh, in March of 2020. It went zooming way up, just like I said, to over 200 basis points. This is a good one for doing a credit line because the banks are going to say, Marcus, you can have a credit line at a relatively inexpensive cost because I know that if we end up in a banking crisis and my cost of credit goes way up, you're going to have to pay me a lot more if you draw on your line, and you probably won't draw so crazy. Uh, and I'll get compensated in part uh, for my costs of funding. So that's exactly why banks like credit sensitive indices. Now, let's see if I can go back to whoops, find my my slides are stuck. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can move. No. Nope. Okay, let's try again. Something happened to my slides. There's only one more, but it's not showing. Let me get out of the slides and try again. Excuse me for... No worries. Going back to my... I've got too many projects going, I think, on my laptop at the same time. Well, in any case, I think you got the idea. Uh, if I don't find my slides again, I think you got the idea. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to see if I can find my slides and come back. But that's that's pretty much the story that I wanted to tell you for today. Mm -hmm. And OK, I'll let you search for your slides and I, I'm going to also ask a question. Good. For 2020 April, when we see the structural I don't see it. there's a big negative shock coming in people looking for funding and borrowing on credit lines and you're saying that uh, if we use a sofa which is not adjusting for credit spread that would be a horrible thing right and then we have that because it doesn't adjust for the credit risk and then if we use LIBOR and we, which is discontinuing right so that's still not good that's why we have the axi which captures the jumps in the credit risk or borrowing cost associated with credit risk. That's why it's pretty good to substitute for what we had before, which was based on LIBOR. Yeah, I would say it's not only pretty good, it's much better than LIBOR. Oh, how come? Um, and the reason is that when, when I'm borrowing at my bank uh, to get funding for Marcus's credit line, I'm not borrowing at a three month maturity like LIBOR anymore. I used to do that before the financial crisis. When I borrow money these days, I'm borrowing all across the curve at longer maturities. And so when I want to be compensated for my cost of credit, I should be compensated based on my actual cost of credit, not my three month cost of credit, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm hardly borrowing any money anymore at three month maturities. And why is that? Well. Uh, that's the same reason that LIBOR is now being discontinued. No banks are borrowing at three months anymore. LIBOR is no longer representative of my cost of credit. And, mm -hmm. and that's why uh, Axie is much better. It's not only a substitute for LIBOR, it's a big improvement on LIBOR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I, are you succeeding finding your slides? Actually, I think you can have the paper and show us the picture from the paper. I saw the PDF of the paper. Yeah, well, I'm gonna uh, just try to reproduce my slides. Okay. Uh, for some reason, the file got corrupted and stopped working, but now I think I've got it. 
back. And I don't think there's that much more to show anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was only one more slide in total. I'm going to go to it right now. It's called Concluding Remarks. Hang on. <laughs> I'm going to have Concluding Remarks. Isn't that exciting? Yes. I have more questions, though. <laughs> Okay, well, good. I'm glad you have more questions. And uh, let's go to full screen. Well, you can see my concluding remarks on this screen. So here are my concluding remarks. First, Axie is an index of, of bank credit spreads across the curve on recent wholesale publicly issued bank debt. And that's that's just what it is. It's across the curve, meaning it's across all maturities. And that's why I said it's better than LIBOR because LIBOR is only one maturity and it's not a maturity that banks are using very much anymore. So why would you want an index that banks are not using anymore? You would want an index that uh, gives you the credit spreads that banks are actually using, which is across the whole curve. Part, by the way, the reason the banks are not issuing at three months anymore is that new regulations of, of banks require that they borrow at longer maturities rather than shorter maturities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk about those new Basel regulations, but there are basically three types. One is called liquidity coverage ratio. One is called net stable funding ratio. And the last one, which is more obscure, is called TLAC, total loss absorbing capital, which requires that banks borrow a lot of their unsecured funding at long maturities. Uh, for an obscure reason related to failure resolution. And those, all of those Basel requirements have been implemented in China too. So China is now subject to the same restrictions. And if that hasn't happened already, then soon at least China, China's banks will be borrowing a lot more at longer maturities. Mm -hmm. And SHIBOR, the Shanghai Interbank Offering Rate, will no longer be very representative of bank credit costs in China. So China Axie should be much better than Shibor if it's not already much better. And uh, Xiaoyan's paper shows that it's a very feasible and implementable credit spread index in China. So I would recommend for any anybody that's advising the PBC, uh, I would recommend uh, that you go to the PBC and tell them, hey, maybe we shouldn't rely so much on Shibor anymore we should move over to China Axie because it's more representative of China's bank credit spreads. By definition, it's the average of the spread they actually issue. It's more representative and it's more robust because it's based on a lot more data. And then the people at the PBC will say, gosh, I'm gonna to have to read Chow Yan's paper. And once I've read it, I'm gonna see it's a way better credit spread index than Shibor. And then maybe PBC will implement regulations or at least use its uh, ability to encourage, which is quite big in China. Uh, mm -hmm. It can encourage banks to move away from Shibor and to move on to Axie. That's what I would recommend if I was a regulator. And mm -hmm. remember, I have no commercial stake in this. I do not get one penny from, uh, from doing this uh, because I have no commercial interest at all in Axie or anything related to Axie. I sim I'm simply an academic. Second point on my slide is how the index is constructed. It's simply a weighted average of credit spreads with weights that reflect both the secondary market transactions volumes and the primary market issuance volumes. And then finally, and that's the main economics, the economic rationale for why you would want a credit sensitive uh, reference rate is that it increases pre credit provision. If you reference your credit lines to Axie, then there will be better credit provision, more efficient credit provision. The macro economy will be better because banks will be able to provide funding at a lower cost, total lower cost to corporate borrowers on credit lines. And remember, credit lines are the majority of corporate funding in the United States, mm -hmm. not bank loans. Bank loans are smaller than, corp than credit lines in the United States. That is uh, straight bank loans. Credit lines are another form of bank lending. And I'm mm -hmm. hoping that somebody in some of your uh, 
participants today, Xiaoyan, will be able to tell me whether credit lines are important in China too, because I don't know if they are or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's I, it for Yeah, thank you, Professor Duffy. And I have a, a couple of questions. I think the idea of SOFA is not, you know, it's everywhere in the United States and it has been quite successful in the United States. But in China, uh, we're still in the under the regime of, you know, government and the central bank have a lot of says on the um, where the interest rate should be. Okay. And then people, so they have been so far not paying a lot of attention. Well, I wouldn't say, I mean, but most of the average people have not been paying a lot of attention to the credit risk. Now, I, what, I want, what I want to ask you is, because we did everything, the methodology is following your earlier paper, right? I want to know whether, do you think the credit risk in the global market is actually quite correlated given that they receive the same, well, sometimes the same, sometimes similar, sometimes different shocks, right? What would be your view, you know, the cross market axes, what would, how they are gonna be related because in Japan and Europe, you know, they're all different. That's a terrific question. <clears throat> so, uh... I just wrote a paper uh, with two colleagues, one at the Federal Reserve Board, Leslie Shung, and one, a former IMF economist, Laura Kudres. And we show that the cost of dollar funding to China's banks is highly correlated uh, with the cost of dollar funding to US banks, except in a crisis like the COVID crisis of March, 2020, when the cost of dollar funding to China banks was much higher. And the reason for that was uh, basically frictions in cross-border lending mm -hmm. and the uh, concerns that by international investors about lending dollars to China banks directly. The difference between the dollar cost to China banks and the dollar cost to US banks, after correcting for credit quality, the difference is called the cross-currency basis. And the mm -hmm. cross-currency basis was very large when COVID shock hit. Uh, and our paper shows why that might be the case and what we can do to address that problem. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, though, the cost of funding for large global banks like ICBC, Bank of China, and so on, these are highly correlated across the globe. But there are local market conditions that also uh, cause a basis now, the cost of funding in renminbi, which is your AXI uh, results, is different than the cost for borrowing in dollars for the obvious reason that the renminbi is a different currency. It has different uh, mm -hmm. risk-free interest rates, and it has different rates of expected appreciation. Most recently, as you know, the renminbi has been going down in value relative to the dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that means that the cost of credit in, uh, in renminbi terms will reflect the expected depreciation rate mm -hmm. uh, of the renminbi relative to the dollar. But in terms of dollar funding, uh, I think I already described the fact that the global market is highly connected. So there's a lot of correlation, but it's not perfectly connected. And there is an important basis uh, that could be addressed by a number of different uh, regulatory tools. China mm -hmm. has, as you know, China has a relatively closed capital account. It's very difficult uh, to export capital into and out of China compared to other countries. And that yeah. and that also causes some segmentation between cost of credit to Chinese banks and to American banks. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm, a, I'm not American, I'm Canadian, but uh, <laughs> I'm always interested in the difference between China and the United States. And I teach a course at Stanford on China's financial system. And so I follow it very closely. Interesting. I should. OK, is that open to public or is it no. online? It's uh, open to students from China that want to register. And so <laughs> if you have uh, if you have students, but it's only by uh, by arrangement with the my my school. So you would have to. I, I actually co-taught it with PBC school about uh, six years ago. And, really? Yeah. 
recently know. I've been uh, uh, co-teaching it with uh, Beijing University, your 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 uh, sister university in in Beijing. My uh, my, you know, I graduated from Beijing University. So yeah, it's a wonderful school. So uh, yeah, uh, if you have students at at Beida, uh, then they can register for the course, and if uh, you have if you have students at at Tsinghua University, then they would have to do it by special arrangement. You could always send me an email and we could try to get them on. I would love to, because six years ago, that's the year I came to PBCSF. So I didn't get the opportunity to know that joint venture. Maybe we should pick it up. I will talk to Beida and see whether we can have a joint course in some way. But that's not the question I want to ask. I want to oh. ask one question and then I'll let the audience ask. You know, I, I appreciate the opportunity to directly discuss with you. Um, so my understanding is, um, so the, the, the purpose of Axie is to capture the credit risk more precisely, right? And uh, so right now, so you, you were mentioning that we should talk to the central bank, the PBOC, uh, as you know, for the regulators, regulators, so what they can do is at least monitor what's going on, right? And of course they can influence where it's going. And did you notice one thing, Professor Duffy, uh, that a lot of Chinese, well, I would say a lot, let's say multiple Chinese firms, actually, when they borrow in China, when they have higher interest rates, well, with capital control, they cannot get the uh, foreign banks directly give them money. So they actually, you know, move to the US bond market. Actually, they, they borrow directly from there. So I'm just wondering, in your most recent study, did you separate out, you know, the Chinese firms in the bond market? They actually directly borrow from the uh, U.S. bond market. And is there the credit spread? Would that be different from very different? I bet from what we see in in China. Uh, well, it was first again. It's a dollar. It's a dollar interest rate okay. that they're getting rather than a renminbi interest rate. So that makes it different automatically. But then it's also different uh, than, let's say, uh, Axie for the U.S., uh, because um, there are capital controls and there are also uh, different credit qualities for China's banks relative to U.S. banks. Mm -hmm. By the way, the top five China banks, I think, are about as safe as the top five U.S. banks. So there shouldn't be big differences in average credit quality, um, because the top China banks, I think, are too big to fail. And the top five U.S. banks, well, they're also too big to fail, but not as, not as much as in China. China will protect its banks more than the U.S. government protects its banks. Mm -hmm. So I think the average quality is, is about the same for China banks. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, the appetite um, among global investors to, have, to lend dollars to China banks is a mm, little bit less than the appetite to lend to U.S. banks. By the way, I am a lender. Did you know that? I'm a lender to Chinese banks. What do you mean? <laughs> because I, I buy certificates of deposit in dollars issued by the Bank of China. Really? What's uh, the rate? Uh, the rate is among the best rates available to US uh, dollar depositors. The CDs offered by Bank of China are among the highest rates offered to US dollar investors. Like five, six, seven percent? Well, right now, I haven't checked lately because, as you know, the uh, the Fed has been raising dollar interest rates a lot, but yeah. they're they're much closer to wholesale uh, interbank rates than the rates offered by U.S. banks to U.S. depositors. The U.S. Wow. banks have, have a very uh, cozy relationship uh, that lets them borrow money very cheap from depositors. But if if the Bank of China comes to the United States to borrow, they have to pay close to the wholesale market rate. That's why I lend them money. Uh, you know, my own little my own little savings uh, go into some of some of it goes into China banks. Yeah, well, yeah, you're on the liability side of the Bank of China balance sheet. <laughs> well, anyways, so I will ask um, the audience um, because you know, Professor Duffy, you you taught um, Chinese students before. They are you know they appreciate the opportunity to listen to you. So. Um, they don't. They want to learn and understand what's going on. So, audience, uh, do you guys have any questions for Professor Duffy? 
Marcus, do you have any questions? I, I do actually. Um, firstly, Cheyenne, thank you so much for hosting this session and, and, and Daryl, um, an excellent presentation. Um, uh, a very, a very simple question first. You mentioned uh, your work with uh, the 2022 paper uh, with Cooperman. Is that been released yet? And where can we get a copy of that if it's available? I haven't put it on my webpage, but I will in the next couple of weeks, and I'll send you a private, a private copy. Um, but it'll be on my webpage within a couple of weeks, and also into SSRN within a month at latest. Thank you. Thank you. It's, yeah, it's, I, it's completely new work. Understood. I was just going to um, very briefly um, touch on touch on some of our experiences in implementing Axie. Um, you know, first and foremost, we support so far. Uh, we think it's a, um, a highly robust array that's um, applicable for a very wide variety of use cases. Um, and then over time, we also support um, AXI, uh, which was conceived by, by Daryl and his academic collaborators. Um, as Daryl mentioned, it's, you know, the, the genesis really was some concerns expressed by some banks here in America that in times of economic stress, um, SOFA and near risk free rates typically move lower, um, whereas their cost of funding can move higher, um, therefore creating a, a potential mismatch between um, the bank's assets uh, and their liabilities. Marcus, we're losing you. We don't hear you anymore. Let's see if there are anybody else with their hand raised so that we can uh, we can get a, a more more questions. There's only a few minutes, three minutes left. Yeah. I hope so, somebody has a, somebody else has a question. Maybe they normally ask you afterwards, so don't. <laughs> I have to go to work uh, immediately after work. Top of the hour, so yeah. I won't be able to stay on after the top of the hour. Are you walking I, over? Uh, sometimes I walk, but it's about an hour walk from here. So I'm probably, because I'm running a little bit late today, I'll probably take a bus or the uh, subway. The subways here are not as nice as the ones in Beijing. You have much better subways. Yes, we do. You know, I graduated from Columbia. Are you living up west side? Yeah, I'm living in uh, Chelsea, which is uh, sort of just below Midtown. Mm, it's not far. But anyways, I think, you know, if we put your website here in our flyer, and if you want to follow up on your new studies, I think it's fascinating. You showed us this, you know, April 2020 results. That's just fantastic. I think people will follow up on those new researchers, and, and they all know who you are. I think they're a little bit scared to ask you questions. That's another factor here. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Um, we would love to- can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. I, now, I sincerely apologize for that. I know I've only got two minutes left and I'll just be very quick and finish. Um, the thing that really resonated with our poem about um, the proposal um, by Daryl and Axi is that, you know, really, if you look at his paper available on his website, it stays away from libel intentionally. Um, and, it, and it doesn't always necessarily correlate highly with libel. Um, I would actually say that, that the approach that, that actually takes is, is really rebuilding credit sensitivity from first principles, not necessarily trying to synthetically rebuild libel. Um, and that was what was so compelling about the solution um, for us. And so we implemented a phase transition plan for the last couple of years, which involved um, you know, communicating with the largest banks um, as well as policymakers here in the United States. And we have partnered with an American asset manager and their indexing unit um, called Investor. Um, also working closely with the, the industry associations such as ISDA uh, in the loan market, the LSTA and in Asia, the Asia Pacific Loan Market Association. And we launched the embassies in July, um, um, not just Axie, but also Fixie. And as Daryl mentioned that that fixie reflects the, the, the broader credit conditions across the United States economy. 
Um, the indices are now available via Bloomberg and Refinitiv. And I believe that Invesco have engaged a, a big four accounting firm to perform a review against international um, best practice principles um, for financial benchmarks. And you know, we're really uh, delighted um, that, that Xinhua and, and uh, Cheyenne have, along with the collaborators, um, have put together this feasibility study uh, for a Chinese AXI um, as part of a broader set that we're moving forward with. Um, University of Oxford, we're having conversations around the feasibility of a sterling and a euro AXI. Also in Japan, we're working with them um, with the University of Toronto on a Canadian AXI as well. And we think that there's um, scope, you know, where there is a, an opportunity to produce an IOSCO compliant uh, credit sensitive spread. Uh, we think there's an opportunity to move forward with that. We're really excited about that. But I'll, I'll pause there and just again say thank you, Cheyenne and Professor Duffy, for this session today. Cheyenne, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that if if your colleagues are interested, it might be interesting to look at the Ch uh, China Axie for dollar borrowing by China banks. That would be an interesting project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It might not be enough data, but it might be worth looking into because China banks do borrow a lot in dollars and having a dollar uh, China credit spread index could be useful. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, also uh, Xiaoyan, I wanted to thank you very, very warmly for inviting me to speak with you today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to reach your, your colleagues. And I hope we have a chance to talk again soon. Yeah, totally, totally. We would love to have you back very soon maybe next year <laughs> good yeah all right so uh well um i think that will be uh today's talk and again thank you professor duffy and uh, like i said um thank you again for giving us the opportunity to listen to the most upfront research and studies um all right so this is the end of the broadcast as well as the workshop and we will keep in touch and everybody Professor Duffy, you should go to work and everybody else, you know, uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. Have a nice evening. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Mark. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.